Now, some of you might not know exactly what a neuropsychologist is or does, so let me just give you a few clues. Now, this is a very recent photo taken in the neurosurgery <laughs> Theatre at Auckland, now don't laugh too soon, at Auckland Hospital, and you can see the patient there, eyes open wide awake, and the man with the bald head is the neurologist, the man who considers himself the very top of the medical hierarchy, the man with the brains and the skills and training to have diagnosed what was wrong with this patient, and to tell that fellow in the dunce's cap, the lowly paid neurosurgeon, where to cut. But the person I really want you to notice is a woman sitting to one side, looking very calm and peaceful, and with a book of knowledge on her head. Now, she's probably, you can just about hear her mind whirring, I think she's wondering what these two guys are doing to this poor patient to make him even worse than he was before they started. And I think she's praying that the neuropsychological tests she'll need to assess him later will filter by osmosis from that book into her brain, so that later she'll have the right tests to assess the, this fellow's cognitive abilities and impairments, and perhaps later she'll write his story up as a case study. Now, the book of knowledge on her head is this very large, heavy book on the left. This is called by neuropsychologists the Bible. And, of course, it's much more important than the very normal-sized book beside it called Trouble in Mind. But I can tell you that Trouble in Mind is much easier to read in bed, <laughs> partly because it's light, but also it's just a book of stories, 15 stories about patients that I have worked with and who had various different brain disorders and how they coped with those and what they taught me about the mind and its potential. Now... Um, the first, well, before I actually, before I get to HM, but I'll just let you read that while I'm telling about this. I love case studies, and I love neurological case studies because I think they put a human face to facts. They lend order to chaos, and most importantly, they give meaning to loss. And, you know, so many of us are interested in these sorts of case studies because by the time we're 60, more than 90% of us will have known someone close to us who has suffered from some sort of a neurological disorder. It might be Alzheimer's, a stroke, a head injury, you know, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, perhaps a child with Asperger's or autism. So they're very, very common, so we can learn a lot from these sorts of case studies. I've got, I'm going to tell you about two of my cases this morning from that book, and the first has to be the most is HM, and he is the most famous and most studied case in medical or psychological history. He's the man who taught us about memory by losing his. Um, now, HM, this is taken at his college graduation. He lived in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, and as a young man, he, well, as a, as a child, he started to have epileptic seizures. Now, i just tell you about of course, HM wasn't his actual name. His name was Henry Mollison. But to protect his identity, nobody knew what his name was, or nobody other than those who worked with him knew what his name was until after his death when he was 82. Because if you've got no memory and you become very famous, you could be very easily exploited. Anyway, he lived in Connecticut. He started having seizures as a child. And when he was 27, the local neurosurgeon, a dapper fellow called William Beecher Scoville, and you see how dapper he is, he said, he actually said, I am going to perform a frankly experimental operation on you, HM, to see if I can cure your epilepsy. And so in August 1953, Scoville stood above an awake Henry and suctioned out the hippocampus first on one side of his brain and then on the other side of his brain. Now, the hippocampus is a seahorse-shaped structure that lies within our temporal lobe, one this side and one that side. And at the time he did this operation, of course, nobody knew the hippocampus had anything to do with memory. They knew it had something to do with epilepsy, that's why he did the operation, but they didn't know it had anything to do with memory, and indeed it was because of HM. We found that out. Anyway... Um, Henry would have been drowsy during the operation and probably didn't notice his memory vanishing as the operation proceeded. But afterwards, of course, Scoville realised, my gosh, you know, I've practically cured his epilepsy, but I've left him with this incredibly dense amnesia. Now, here's a model of Henry's brain, and the red slashes are where he sucked out the hippocampus on each side. But he didn't do any other damage to the brain, so Henry was very quickly realised that he was the perfect experimental subject 
because he actually had a normal intelligence. The only thing he had wrong with him was whatever happened when you got rid of the hippocampus. He lost his memory. But he had a normal intelligence, an intelligence of about 110 until just a few years before he died at the age of 82. Uh, and so he, so he spent the next 55 years of his life being basically a professional subject. And most of the study on him was done at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, and in the laboratory of Professor Suzanne Corkin. Here's Sue up there. And next to her is the biography she wrote of HM after his death. And it was published just last year, and it's a wonderful book. I recommend it. Now, about three times a year, Henry would travel from where he lived in Connecticut. He first lived with his parents, and when they died, he lived in a nursing home. If you've got no memory, you, you, have to, you are dependent on other people. And he would travel to MIT and stay in the research hospital there for about three weeks, while Sue and her various PhD students and postdoctoral fellows assessed his memory. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time because I was a postdoctoral fellow at MIT under Sue um, when Henry was 59. He'd already been being assessed for 30 years, but there was still stuff to learn. Anyway, um, I guess I was pretty nervous and probably didn't sleep much the, first no the night before I first met HM because I, like all psychology students, had been learning about HM ever since Psychology 101. And here I was, I was going to meet him. Anyway, I didn't need to... I didn't need to worry because he's a charmer. He's an absolute charmer. Here he is, and this is a photo I took of him when he was 60. Now, there's a wee story behind that. Of course, no one is allowed to know his name to protect his identity, and of course, no one is allowed to know what he looked like either. You weren't allowed to take photos of HM or videos or anything. But I was a Kiwi, and I didn't take much notice of rules. So I snapped just a two little photos with my box brownie just to keep for myself. Unfortunately, um, many years later, I was having dinner with Sue Corkin, and after a few too many red wines, I confessed. And she was, understandably, rather taken aback, even horrified, and she said, Jenny, give me back the negatives and all of the prints. I have to destroy them. Okay, yes. Anyway, that's all right. Many years later, she was writing his biography after he died, and she found, oh, we've got no photos. And so she had to get in touch with me and say, could I... I hope you didn't obey me. I hope you've kept a print, because I would like to use one. I thought about it for a while, and then I let her use one. And now those two photos of mine are hot property, and they're going to be in every textbook forever and ever more. <laughs> it's my main claim to fame. HM's professional photographer, and it just tells you, you should never obey all of the rules, especially if they're stupid. <clears throat> anyway... Here I was, I was going, coming to meet HM this first morning, and I go in there, and there he is sitting there reading his newspaper in the tea room, all by himself, and I go up to him and say, hello, Henry. He looks up, lo lovely smile, shakes my hand. Hello, he says. I said, I'm Jenny Ogden, and I wondered if you'd mind if I gave you a few tests. Whatever's beneficial, said Henry. OK, look, I'll just go away and get my tests, and then I'll come back. Is that OK? I'll still be here, says Henry. So. I walk around behind his chair and back to the front. I slowly walked, it took me about six seconds. And when I got back to the front, he's reading his paper again, I said, hello, Henry, do you remember who I am? <clears throat> do you remember who I am? No, I can't say that I do, he said. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, I'm Jenny Ogden, and I've come all the way from New Zealand just to see you. Do you know where New Zealand is? Well, yes, I think I do. It's a small country to the east of Australia, and it has millions of sheep. How do you know that? Well, I don't know. And you know, I had an aunt, and she emigrated to Australia when I was a kid. And he launched into the story about an aunt who emigrated to Australia. And after that, every time I said I came from New Zealand, he would launch into this exact same story with exactly the same words, same intonations. And he had a whole little store of these stories from his past that he would launch into if he was cued with a particular word. Anyway. After his surgery, he had these little stories from the back, but after his surgery, he never again learned a new conscious long-term memory. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. New, the reason he could remember these little stories from his past and also all the vocabulary he learned from his past and you know where New Zealand was, he learned that at school, everything up until when he was 27, that's when he had his operation, um, was because as you remember from that model of the brain, the rest of the cortex was fine, and we actually store our memories all over the brain in the cortex. So he had these memories there. 
However, um, he didn't make any new memories. And what we've found from studying Henry and many other patients since then is if we only remove or damage one hippocampus, our long-term memory will be okay. Not wonderful, but okay. But if you remove both hippocampi, you're stuffed. No more long-term memories. And um, this is, here are some examples of what I mean by long-term memory. Long-term memory in psychological jargon is anything that we can hang on to longer than a, a minute or two, right? So if, I had no long, if you had no long-term memory, you wouldn't, have a, you wouldn't remember that story I told you about Auckland you know, Hospital. Now, you'd have, that's gone completely. So these are examples of long-term memory, and Henry could do none of these. He couldn't learn new word lists, stories, new facts, f faces, you know, his new address. He didn't know, ever remember again a name or a face. He never remembered who Sue Corkin was after working with her for 55 years. He didn't know how old he was. After the day after his 60th birthday, I said, how old do you think you are, Henry? He said, mm, 38. Or sometimes he said 42. He just seemed to pull a number out of the air. And um, when I later showed him that, one of those pictures I said, showed him, I took of him when he was 16, I said, who do you think this is, Henry? And he said, well, I think it's my father. And that's because here's a picture of him with his parents just after a surgery, and his father looks rather like him. But if I gave him a mirror, and he looked at himself in the mirror, he would know he'd got old because he knew a mirror didn't lie, his intelligence was intact, and of course he'd been seeing mirrors you know, as in his childhood. So he knew then that he'd got old. Um, but he did, he had some sorts of memory he was still able to do, and by studying him we found what these were. And the most important sort of memory that he could still do was called immediate memory. And so this does not use the hippocampus, right, because he could do it. Immediate memory is the memory, the ability to hold on to about seven bits of information for seven seconds, and then it's gone. That's why you can hold on to a phone number just long enough to punch in the numbers on the phone, and then it vanishes, and he could do that. Then he could also do working memory, because that's the ability to manipulate that information in your immediate memory as long as no one distracts you. So he could do, for example, simple mental arithmetic. And another sort of memory he could do was called motor or procedural memory, learning new motor sequences, like riding a bike, for example. And this is an unconscious form of memory. We're not aware that we're learning this sort of stuff. But he could do this so it doesn't rely on the hippocampus. For example, when he was 60, he, hurt his, he sprained his ankle badly and had to first use a wheelchair and then a walking frame to get around. And he very quickly learned how to use a wheelchair, how to manipulate it, how to use a walking frame, how to manipulate it. That's motor memory. But he didn't know he was learning that. He never knew he'd learned that. So every time he brought in the wheelchair, the walking frame, he had no idea why. He didn't know he'd sprained his ankle. Every time he stood up on it, the pain was new all over again. So he had no knowledge of learning this stuff, but he could do it. He act, what he did is Henry lived in a seven-second bubble of time, the diameter of his immediate memory span. His past was made up of his personal events. The only things to remember from his past were these little stories like his aunt immigrating to Australia, those sorts of things. And he had no future because we cannot imagine a future if we don't have an ongoing long-term memory. There were just a few exceptions to this. And... Uh, We've discovered these in various ways. For example, he knew all about um, film stars like Cary Grant, because they were around when he was a young man, right? When he was a teenager, before he was 27. So he knew all about people like Cary Grant. He could tell you all about people like that. And if you asked him who the President of the United States was, he would usually say Franklin Roosevelt, because Roosevelt was a president when HM was a teenager. But occasionally, he would come up with John F. Kennedy, and John F. Kennedy wasn't a president of the United States until after Henry's operation in 1953. And so, you know, I was a bit of a fan of Elvis, so one day I said to him, do you know who Elvis Presley is? And he said, yes, I do. He's a singer, and he sings jive. So he got the gist of who Elvis was, the gist, the jive, he couldn't get the new word rock and roll. He never learned a new word after he was 27, right? But he got the gist of it. 
And later they did an MRI scan of his brain 39 years after his surgery and discovered that Scoville, the cowboy neurosurgeon from Hartford, didn't actually remove his entire hippocampus on each side. He'd suctioned out most of it but left a wee bit at the posterior part. So perhaps that's why he was able to hang on to a few little memories that perhaps had some particular emotional connection with him or were on the news a great deal. People often ask, did Henry have a sense of self? And yes, he absolutely had a sense of self. It wasn't as complete as ours, but he certainly had a sense of self. He had a gentle sense of humour, a lovely personality, a twinkle in his eye, and he always tried to do his best because he had an intact intelligence, uh, he could understand instructions, and that he always did the, as best as he could. And if it, sometimes when he was asked, do you ever get tired of doing all these tests? He'd say, no, whatever I can do to help others. When he died in December 2008 at the age of 82, he had featured in over 12,000 journal articles, and his obituary was published in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Economist, The Lancet, and many other esteemed publications. But his legacy to science didn't stop there. After his death, he, his brain was scanned in his skull for nine hours, it was taken out of his skull, it was scanned for another nine hours, then it was flown to San Diego, where it was sectioned into 2,000 thin, paper-thin slices in a 30-hour online procedure that anyone could watch. And then that brain that was put together as a three-dimensional brain map that neuroscientists will be able to use to scan from the whole brain to individual neurons into the future. So Henry's gift to science is a gift that keeps on giving darling thing, isn't he lovely? Now, my second patient, Janet, is not famous like Henry, but her case is just as interesting. Janet, the woman who lived in the right side of space. I first met Janet at Auckland Hospital on a bed round. And, you know, we're trotting around the room with all the little baby doctors and things. Junior doctors, baby doctors, that's what we used to call them. And uh, we always stood outside the ward before we went in to see the patient at while the registrar told us her history. Now, Janet was a 50-year-old woman. She w worked in an uh, art supply business, and she was rather a good amateur artist herself. And on her 50th birthday, she failed to blow the candles out on the left side of her birthday cake. And that night, she had a seizure, and they took her to neurology, and they scanned her brain, and they found she had a nasty-looking tumour in the right side of her brain in the right parietal lobe. Anyway, the neurosurgeon had already biopsied her tumour and only yesterday had explained to Janet what it was, what was, what was going on with her. And so he had told her that it was a malignant tumour and if he removed it and she had radiotherapy, she might have, say, three or four years left of a reasonable quality life. So it was a bit of a surprise to see her sitting up in bed, big smile on her face, you know. She was a perfectly, she thought she was perfectly fine a few days ago. Now she knew she had this terminal brain tumour, and yet she was looked as happy as Larry. So I thought she's either a very good actor or she's in denial. Anyway, we go over to her bed, and the surgeon starts his examination, and it's very clear that the left side of her body is weak. And for example, if he says, put both hands in the air, she only puts her right hand in the air, and her left arm just hangs by her side. And uh, the other thing is she's got She's got this pink nightdress on, and the left strap is slipping so far off her left shoulder, it's almost exposing her breast. And the nurse bustles over and says, Janet, let's fix up your nightdress. She says, no, leave it, she says. I'm starting a new fashion. I thought it might cheer you doctors up. <laughs> so here's Janet. Now, already I'm thinking, aha, uh -huh, she's got neglect of the left side of her body and de denial to go along with it. And I thought, if she's got neglect of the left side of the body, she's probably going to have visual spatial neglect as well. And I thought that was good because I was just doing research on that. Anyway, let me tell you the definition of hemineglect. That's neglect or hemineglect. Following damage to one hemisphere of the brain, the patient appears to be unaware of stimuli in the side of space opposite their brain lesion. Hemineglect is most severe and persistent after extensive damage to the right parietal lobe resulting in neglect of the left side of space. And this is this, her CT scan, and that nasty-looking white thing is the big tumour that she had. So she's the perfect person to have left visuospatial neglect. Now, people with this disorder, if you give them pictures to copy, they only copy the right side, ignore the left. 
if you if they eat only the food on the right side of their plate and then complain that they're hungry. If you stand on their left side, they won't talk to you, they swear at you, they ignore you. If you go around their right side, they're happy as Larry. That's the strain, it's a very bizarre disorder. So, um, oh, the other, and the thing that's important about it, it's nothing to do with seeing or hearing. Their senses are fine. If I had a right lesion and left him in a neglect, I wouldn't want to know about you lot. I just wouldn't give a stuff about you. I'd only be interested in you. It's a higher cognitive disorder. It's not about seeing, right? It's a higher cognitive disorder. And um, so anyway, we, I then wanted to impress the baby doctors, whip out my high-tech neuropsych battery of tests, bedside battery of tests, and this is what Janet did. First of all, I gave her an A4 sheet of paper with lines drawn all over it, high-tech, and I said, Janet, cross all the lines. And so she crossed all the lines on the right side of the page and left all the ones on the left. And I said, well, are you sure you got them all? She said, mm -hmm. all right, and crossed a few more, but on the right side again, just the same ones, okay. Then I asked her to put the numbers in a clock face to copy a cube and copy a five-pointed star. So she puts the numbers in the clock face, all down the right side and falling off the bottom. She ain't gonna go over to that left side. She copies the right side of the cube, and at first just the right side of the star, and I say, Janet, you sure you've got all that star? And she says, ooh, all right, and she copies in that funny-looking point on the left. Then I gave her this picture on the top. This is the, called the Ogden scene test, and this was my PhD. My whole PhD, I drew this picture, and this will tell you why I did a um, PhD in neuropsychology and not fine arts. <laughs> that's one of the reasons. Anyway, that's my picture, and I just, for my PhD, I got that picture, and I asked 100 people with brain damage to copy it. Dead easy, right? That's what you do, a PhD in neuropsychology. And this is Janet's drawing in the bottom. She just copies the right half of it, right? So I say, Janet, now I point to the things in the top, the tree, the house, the fence, the tree, and she names them because she can see them perfectly well, and if I fo you know, make her attend to them, she said that. So I said, well, why won't you draw in, draw in the fence? Oh, I will if you really want me to, but it'll probably blow down on the next wind. <laughs> and this is the sort of thing, they often have this rationale for why they won't do this stuff, why she wouldn't put a, you know, a nightdress strap up, etc. It's a higher cognitive disorder. They have this strange rationale, and that's a form of denial, which is also very common after right parietal lesions, and it means that they, they, they deny the seriousness of their illness and sometimes their limbs. She would deny her left limbs. I was sitting by her one day and she said, Get that arm out of my bed, pointing to her left arm. I said, I can't, it's your arm. She says, oh, bloody hunk of meat. Doesn't seem to belong to me. So she had this sort of form of denial, which made her rather a happy person in spite of this nasty, nasty tumour. Now, she had this, the normal sort of neglect, which is where they sort of look out at the environment, divide it in half, and then ignore the left. But some patients have an even more bizarre form of neglect. Here's the Ogden scene test, beautiful paint picture again. The middle drawing is another one by Janet, the typical one, and on the bottom is by a different patient. Now what she did is she looked at every object in front of her and then neglected the left of every single object, which is really bizarre and quite clever when you think about it. So she, neglect, she looked at the tree on the right and neglected the left of it, and then she looked at the house and neglected the left window, and then she looked at the whole drawing probably and just neglected the whole left of it and that we call that object-centered neglect. And here's some more examples of it. The patient is asked to copy the tower, and when it's standing up, they copy only the right side. Well, no surprises there. But when you ask them to copy the tower falling over, and they still only copy the right side of the tower, it shows that they're neglecting the object and not the horizontal environment. And how about this for bizarre? You are, the patient with neglect is asked whether these two pictures are the same or different. Now, of course, sometimes the burning house is on the bottom, sometimes it's on the top. So, are these two pictures the same or different? Exactly the same, exactly the same. Well, which house would you rather live in? And they always point to the one that's not on fire. <laughs> it's a higher cognitive disorder. I mean, they're not doing this consciously, right? That's because they've got brain damage, but it's a higher cognitive disorder. And I just want to now, finished with, um, well, finished my, the, the neglect bit with my favourite of all neglect experiments. This was an experiment first carried out by two Italian neuropsychologists called Biziak and Luzzati. 
and they lived in Milan, and they had a group of patients who also lived in Milan, and who had big right hemisphere strokes and left visuospatial neglect. So they got these patients, and they said in their lab, and they said, I want, close your eyes, and I want you to imagine the Piazza del Duomo, the big square in Milan. I want you to imagine it. Right, got it? Yep. Now I want you to tell me all the buildings, or name them, describe them, all the buildings in the square. And what they did was they described or named all the buildings on the imagined right from standing at the door of the cathedral, the Duomo, and looking to the other end of the square. So they, they actually named or described all the buildings A, B, and C. Then they said, right, now imagine you walk to the other end of the square, turn around and look back towards the cathedral, the Duomo, and now again, tell me all the buildings or name the, one, the buildings in the square. And this time, ho oh, ho, they named D, E, and F, all the buildings on the other side of the square, but of course still on their now imagined right side. Okay? So these patients are not only neglecting things out there in the real world, they're neglecting their mental images. And what they're doing is they say, imagine the square, they put the whole thing up in their head, they've got all the information, and then they divide it in half and then they neglect the left. Sorry, they, they, they neglect the right, and they only get the things on the... Sorry, I'm confusing myself. They neglect the left and only get the things on the right. Now, to get back to Janet, she did have that tumour removed. She had radiotherapy and three months intensive rehabilitation, and she got well enough to go back home and even go back to work part-time. But she couldn't walk there because she would only turn right and never left. And she wasn't very good at typing because she'd never pushed those letters on the left side of the keyboard. After a couple of years, her tumour grew back, she didn't want any more treatment, so she came back home and her husband would give her, remember she was an amateur artist, her husband would give her big sheets of paper and lots of lovely coloured paints, and she'd paint away to her heart's content really crazy drawings because the right parietal lobe has also got to do with visuospatial cognition and ability. Crazy drawings all squashed in the right side of the page, and they called it her Picasso phase. <laughs> so just to finish, I just want to thank all of those hundreds of patients over the years who have welcomed me into their lives and submitted to all my bizarre tests, often within a few days of finding they had some ghastly brain disorder. And you know, they knew this wasn't going to help them, this research, but it gave them a boost to know that it might help someone like them in the future. It really did seem to give them that boost. And, you know, without the Henrys and Janets of the world, we would know a great deal less about the way the mind works. And I want to leave you with this wonderful, I love this, this wonderful cartoon by your very own Australian national living treasure, Michael Lunig, one of my favourite people. And... Um, you know, I used to give this to patients of mine who were struggling with rehabilitation, which is a terrible thing, rehabilitation, you know, after a head injury or stroke. You know, you go along and then what happens? You know, you, it, it plateaus or it get, you, you don't seem to be making any progress and you get down and depressed. So I'd give them this cartoon and I'd pin it up in their bathroom or somewhere they could see it every day to inspire or motivate them, motivate them how to get on. And you know, most of us wouldn't have a clue how terrible it must be to, to try and rehabilitate from some sort of brain disorder, but we can all benefit from this philosophy. So next time in your journey through life and you're feeling disheartened, just stop and have a little rest and look at the stars and smell the roses and then get up and open the next gate and walk through it and look towards the horizon and keep on walking, but make sure you keep talking to the people along the way, especially the ones that are smiling back at you, and look at all the little wonderful things along the way, enjoy the scenery, and that's how you get there. Thank you. <laughs>